Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so we'll just wait a couple more minutes because we are still a little early, but it looks like uh, we're having a pretty good turnout. Looks like everybody's able to join with no problems. Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, so I'm seeing that everyone's uh, bidding a good afternoon in the chat box, which is really nice. Uh, good afternoon to you too. Um, so just some uh, housekeeping. Um, so we're recording this live and you are more than welcome to interrupt uh, via audio if you have a question that's relevant at that moment. You can also post your question to the chat box, um, though I won't be able to monitor the chat box very closely. And so if somebody notices that there's some question, that, question that's flying by that I didn't notice, feel free to let me know. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, this is CS211 Computer Architecture. Um, I'm Yipeng Huang, um, and I'll be the professor for you for this class for sections five through eight. And the purpose of this class today is to quickly overview what's the plan for this semester. We'll talk about um, the mechanics for the class and also uh, talk about kind of what are the broader directions and why it's important to study computer architecture. So first let's talk about what is computer architecture. Um, the overall takeaway about this class is that it's a class about computing abstractions. Um, and so let's really quickly talk about where this class fits in in the course sequence for the undergraduate uh, computer science major. Um, so the prerequisite for this class is CS uh, 1112, uh, 112 data structures, where in that class you learned how to use data structures to store data and manipulate them efficiently using algorithms. Um, concurrently with this class, um, you might be also be taking a class like discrete structures, which is a class that talks about the mathematics that govern how computer science works. And this class here, computer architecture, is one that talks about abstractions that explain to you what is it that allows you to run programs on the fundamental building blocks of computers and what those building blocks are. All right. And some of the classes that depend on this class include um, software methodology, which is about how to organize uh, large complex software programs. Um, and manage complexity. And system programming is a different class that talks about how you would write programs to interact with the operating system. Okay, so let's go into detail what we mean that this class is about abstractions and computer building blocks. Um, so I wanna tie this, these points back to the overall learning goal of this class, which is um, that you will learn about computing abstractions. These include things like low level programming, the memory hierarchy and digital logic using case studies that tie those concepts to real world computer systems that you are using right now um, and explain how they work. So these abstractions that we'll be talking, in uh, talking about include low level programming, the memory hierarchy and digital logic. And let's very quickly talk about what are abstractions, right? So abstractions are a way for us to manage complexity and detail 
so that you can hide the underlying complexity of a system so that you as a user or a programmer sitting higher up in the abstraction hierarchy can have the ability to be more creative uh, and not have to worry about all the details. So some of these abstractions include low-level programming. Uh, so we'll learn about C assembly language, machine code, the ISA, instruction set architecture of computers. We'll learn about memory hierarchy. So how a file system works, how you interact with the file system in a C program. What are the concerns in the main memory, uh, the DRAM, uh, caches of the processor, and how data is actually represented inside a computer. And finally, we'll talk about um, some basic building, building blocks of how computers are built. So these are things that include uh, how data is stored in registers, how they're stored in electronic devices called flip-flops, how you can manipulate those data using arithmetic uh, circuits, units, gates, and so forth. Okay, so let's go into this in a little bit more detail. Um, so again, this is just so to motivate the class and tell you what's coming up next. Um, so one of the uh, languages that we'll be learning in this class is C. C is a very important and foundational programming language. It's a language that's uh, had a lot of influence in the computing world. So languages such as Java and Python all derive their style and their syntax and their look and feel from C. And learning to work with C paves the way for you to be able to pick up other languages that are much more modern and important today. Uh, and so that will be a major component of, of this class. Uh, another aspect of um, the programming aspect is you will learn about how those programs that you write in Java and C get turned into assembly code. And this assembly code is what's the actual interface between software and the hardware, uh, computing hardware offers. And so assembly, is essentially the instruction set is essentially the raw instructions that are able to access um, in the hardware. It's the way that software tells hardware what to do. Another uh, aspect, another set of abstractions that we'll talk about is the memory hierarchy. Uh, and so this is a important concept to master as a computer scientist, as a computer programmer, as a computer engineer. What the memory hierarchy offers is a illusion that allows you to uh, program as if you have infinitely large amounts of infinitely fast uh, memory. And it does this illusion, it creates this illusion by using a uh, system, a, a system of layers of increasingly larger but slower uh, storage devices and memory devices so that at the processor level or at the program execution level it looks like you can access uh, a large and fast storage space so some of these layers include things like the processor registers inside the cpu we have your caches which we'll, we'll learn about uh, dram the memory in your computer and then you have storage devices like flash and USB, hard drives, and ultimately things like the network and uh, redundant storage backup, like tape backup. Okay. Another thing that we'll study is the representation of data. So how data is, uh, sorry, this is not the, uh, this, this next slide here. Another thing that we'll st study is how data is actually stored and represented inside the hardware. So uh, we'll learn that, for example, uh, the data types in programs, integers are not actually real integers. Instead, they're a way to interpret it, uh, binary numbers so that they represent integers. And likewise, we'll learn that floats, float data variables inside your program are not actually real numbers, but instead they're another way to interpret a sequence of bits and bytes so that they represent something that looks like a real number. Right, so this picture here is showing a program example where as you square a 
increasingly large number, eventually you get incorrect results. And this is because you've actually overflowed the data representation of the data type. And while this seem, may seem like uh, nonsense data, there is a rhyme and reason to why the computer is thinking that this is what that data represents. Okay, so any questions so far, just, uh, just in terms our, of our very quick overview of what are the kinds of concepts that we'll be dealing with in this class? So uh, this class is probably like the first time a lot of people you see you, I think it is like how in depth will the lectures go with uh, like introducing this, or if we are even going to be introduced to see it all. So the first uh, four weeks or so of this class will be dedicated to introducing C and we will study uh, examples that will allow you to uh, complete the first C programming assignment. So the first two major assignments are all about uh, C programming and we'll study case studies and how that code operates so that you can understand uh, why that code works and how you can adapt that code to complete your assignment. And um, also what compiler do we use? Oh, sorry. Someone else is going to ask a question. Cut you off. Cut you no, off. Accident. No, no, no. You go ahead. Uh, yeah. So that's a little bit more detail. So the compiler doesn't matter what compiler we'll be using. Um, well, you can use GCC. So that's a standard compiler that you have available on the iLab machines. Um, and I see in the chat box that somebody asked me, um, will there be exams? Um, so there will not be exams. Um, because they are very difficult to administer during this time. Um, and so um, instead of exams, we will use um, quizzes and use the programming assignments as the way to um, keep everybody uh, uh, up to the same progress in class. Uh, question. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I've heard from like students who've taken the course before, like students that like that have taken the course in past semesters. Uh, so they talked about using the iLabs uh, and w using a Unix based shell in a Unix shell interface when uh, submitting assignments. Uh, so are you also going to teach us how to uh, how, how, like how to like work with that as well so when during the class, especially for like assignments and whatnot? Um, so there will be some introduction. Um, so you should be able to know your way around Linux and use the uh, command line uh, in Linux to compile and run your programs. Um, there will be instructions in the assignments that tell you the basic steps, though that is something that um, it's something that you would be expected to be practicing and becoming more comfortable with doing by taking this class. Right. Right, so that's just saying that. So for example, if you're familiar with programming in Java from uh, the prereq class like 112 uh, and you've been doing your Java programming in a IDE development environment like Eclipse, for example, just as uh, a potential, just maybe that's your setup. In this class, you will be transitioning over to using Linux directly to build and run and test your programs. All right. Um, excuse me. Um, yeah. So we would have to like download Linux and then we would write our programming on that system? Uh, so maybe we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves at this point. Um, let's keep that question in mind and then I'll talk about it when we get to um, the, the slide about programming assignments. Okay, um, so uh, this next part is we'll talk about um, the mechanics and the requirements and what we're doing in this class. Uh, so uh, I'm the instructor. Um, you can reach me 
uh, my email address at epeng.huang at rutgers.eu. We have six very talented teaching assistants helping out with this class. Many of them are students who have recently taken uh, this class, CS211, in recent semesters and did well, and they're interested in returning to help with all these questions that um, you've raised about the assignments and learning how to use Linux and compile and run programs. So these are all things that um, I and the teaching assistants are here to help you to do. Um, and the uh, essential information for um, how to contact them and when the recitation and office hours and how to reach them is now live on the class canvas, you can find it um, at this link here. Um, so just as a quick introduction to me as your instructor for this class, um, I am a new professor at uh, Rutgers Computer Science. Uh, I believe actually many of you, many of you if you're sophomores uh, or juniors um, and above, you've already been here at Rutgers Computer Science for longer than I have. Um, my research is in finding ways to create and build abstractions that allow us to use new architectures, emerging architectures, such as quantum computers and analog-based computing. Um, so I'm always looking for students who are interested in pursuing research projects. Um, in the semesters that I don't teach CS211, I teach a new class called Quantum Computing Programs and Systems. And so if that's something that you're interested in, you can look forward to taking that in future semesters. Um, in uh, past years, I've worked with DARPA to uh, do research on uh, how to use analog electronic circuits as a way to speed up scientific computations, like solving differential equations, for example. Um, and uh, computer architecture is a near and dear field of study to me. Um, I've published papers uh, at top conferences within computer architecture, and I've been working with researchers in computer architecture to review papers and manage these conferences uh, in the past few years. So like we have pointed out, uh, all the resources um, for the class are available on Canvas. Um, the syllabus should be fully public to everybody uh, on the internet. So you can access this link from anywhere. Um, and the actual contents of the Canvas is also uh, available if you are logged in with the records.edu address. If you are not registered for this class for course credit, you should um, file a special permission number request with the computer science department. Um, and we will look to see if, uh, we have, if we have the capacity to add you to these sections. Um, we chose two textbooks for this class. Um, both of them are required. Uh, the first is a physical book called Computer Science, A Programmer's Perspective. Um, we specified the third edition, though you can probably also use earlier editions or different editions if, though, if you find those. Um, the book that we'll be using as a reference for studying programming in C is Modern C, available here. And this is available as a electronic book. You can... Uh, uh, find the full copy for free at this link here. Um, so any questions so far? Uh, um, if you have questions about the programming assignment, we'll, we'll get to that shortly. So uh, I'm sure all of you who are dialed in now have no problems accessing the lecture. Um, so some students have asked whether or not I'll be taking attendance. I will not be taking attendance. So it continues to be a very challenging time for students uh, at Rutgers and around the world due to remote learning. And so we'll be try to be as accommodating as possible 
with uh, things like attendance uh, and so forth. And so we are not taking attendance. Um, if you want to access the videos as recordings, they, I will post them to YouTube and the access link for that will be available made on Canvas. Some of the videos will be, uh, will be not public, but will be accessible if you have the access link. We will be doing short quizzes in this class. So we'll use quick and short quizzes as a way to make sure that um, you're keeping track with the class um, and for you to uh, follow along in the lectures and to collect feedback from you, the students, in terms of what's making sense and what's not making sense, uh, what we need to go over again and go in more detail and so forth. Uh, the quizzes will be short, so there'll be 30 minutes for the quizzes. You can log in, try to take the quiz once, uh, and then go find the material need, and then you can take the quiz again, again in a second attempt. Um, and we'll make it so that the quizzes are available for a specific time window. The quizzes are meant to be um, low stakes. Um, they're uh, only worth 2% of the course grade each. Um, they're important. We will not be um, making uh, offering makeup quizzes. So if you miss one of them, you'll have to recover points by, uh, through, by doing well on the assignments. Um, so I see a question about um, how the quiz graded will, grades will be assigned. So uh, you can take the quiz twice, and you will be uh, will be taking uh, will be taking the higher of the two attempts. So there should be no penalty for uh, using both shots at taking the quiz. Good question. Uh, Thirty minutes per attempt. And the quizzes will be based on, uh, on the lectures. Um, sometimes you'll have to go reference the reading. Um, it could be both. And yes, there'll be open notes. OK. Um, the quizzes, some of them will just be multiple choice. Some of them will be uh, free form answers. And the slides are actually already available on the Canvas. Uh, and yes, the slides will be available after class. So the lecture videos are recorded, posted to uh, YouTube, and posted to Canvas. Um, in terms of how many quizzes, I haven't really fully decided yet. Um, ideally, one quiz per week. Again, these are short, quick, uh, low-stake quizzes. Um, and so ideally one per week, and so I'm aiming for 14 quizzes. Um, and yes, the quizzes will be the same time each week. Uh, the quizzes will be outside of the uh, class time, okay? All right, so some of these, some of this information is also available on the syllabus too. Um, if there's anything that hasn't been fully addressed, feel free to um, chime in on the chat box or uh, uh, ask it through the class piazza. Okay, um, so let's move on to the programming assignments. Um, so this will be a major component of this class. The goal is that you will learn the essential knowledge that's needed to work with computer systems, modify and create low level software and hardware implementations using hands on programming exercises. Okay, so we'll be doing six programming assignments in total. Each of them will be worth 12% of the course grade. Um, all of them should be uh, completed through iLab. And so if you're not already, uh, uh, if you don't already have access to the computer science iLab resources, you should go and sign up immediately right away. It's available here. 
And in terms of um, assignments, re uh, questions relating to the assignments, um, if possible, you should try to relay the questions on Piazza. If you send me or any of the TAs any emails on questions that are actually better addressed uh, publicly to the class on Piazza, we'll actually kindly ask that you post the question again to Piazza and we'll try to answer it there. Um, so the Piazza is also live and it's available here. Okay, um, so this is a large class, if um, I'm sure you've noticed. Um, there are 200 students uh, or so currently enrolled in um, these four sections, and there are only seven of us teaching staff. And so we will be relying on automatic compilation, testing, and grading frameworks to check your programming assignment out results and to assign a grade. And so in order for this to work well, uh, you'll have to learn how to create programs that generate output that very carefully follow the specified output formats so that the testing framework can check that your program is working correctly. Um, and uh, in past semesters, we've gotten feedback that the programming assignments the way that the uh, automatic grading framework, the way it works, it tends to uh, it tends to be kind of binary in terms of uh, either you have a program that works completely or uh, it doesn't generate correct outputs at all. And so we've made it so that the grading framework will try to offer more incremental points as you move along and create programs that are working more and more correctly. It'll try to assign points as you get to a more correct program. And at the same time, we're also going to be testing your results more strictly, right? So in the past, we may have only offered a few test cases to check the program. This time around, we'll be checking your programs across a wider array of input cases. And we've also made it so that the automatic grading system will try to give you more feedback on what's not working correctly in your programming assignment. Um, as always, that's important for all of your computer programming assignments. It's important to start early. And uh, the earlier you start, the more quickly you can identify what you're stuck trying to do and ask questions on Piazza to get unstuck and, and, and continue along. And so it's important to get, uh, get started early because so you can go through that cycle several times. The uh, Canvas is set up so that you can uh, uh, submit as many times as you wish. We'll only uh, check the final version that you submit. But unfortunately, we will not be uh, accepting late assignments, the deadline will be enforced by the Canvas system um, and the submission site will close once the deadline passes. Okay, um, so I saw a few questions about the programming assignment. Yes, so the programming assignment is, uh, each, uh, each of the six assignments is worth 12% each. There was a question about whether or not we'll have hidden test cases. No, there will not be hidden test cases. Um, and there was a question about whether or not there is going to be pre-grading. Um, I assume what you mean by pre-grading is um, the automatic testing framework will tell you what the grade for your assignment is, the way it's turned in then. And so that you can see uh, how well your program is doing. And finally, there's a question about whether or not you get feedback every time we submit. Um, so the feedback will be coming through the automatic testing framework. So the testing framework will tell you, uh, will tell you, for example, uh, your output is incorrect because of X and so forth. 
Uh, and then there was a question about will each assignment, so we'll only uh, assign and grade the final submission before the submission deadline closes. And there are questions about um, uh, just kind of continuing with the questions that we had before about uh, whether or not we'll talk about what is Linux and Unix and how to navigate your way around a command line interface. So these are things that you will practice using in this class. Um, so this is often the case with like a first C programming class that this is really the chance for you to become familiar with these uh, command line tools. Okay. Um, so I think that was the major questions that I saw in the chat box. Um, if there's anything I missed, feel free uh, to chime in. Yes. I have a, I have a question. So I was looking into the iLab thing, like how to, I'm still having, I'm still kind of confused on how to uh, use it. Like I activated my computer science account thing. Are we going to go over this when you're learning how to do the C or is that like how to access to iLab stuff? So access to iLab, there are um, resources from the computer science Hello? uh compute from from the computer science uh uh it group that will walk you through how to access iLab um and uh the piazza is also available once the assignment's released for you to uh for you to uh ask questions about what you're um, getting stuck trying to do Okay, so some important words about the importance of working on your programming assignments uh, uh, on your own. Um, so here is a nice little um, comic from XKCD, which uh, showcases kind of the consequences of not having to have the chance to get your hands dirty trying to program um, your own code. Um, and so you don't want to be in a situation at a uh, programming or a software job interview where uh, you didn't have the chance of trying to implement some algorithm or some data structure um, in your own time. And so the point of taking a class like this is for you to gain experience and work through all the details and learn how to do this proficient. Okay, um, so some, again, some important words um, about uh, why it's important to write your own code. Um, so it's important to learn how to study programming smartly. Um, you're encouraged to discuss your homework with your classmates on Piazza, and you are encouraged to research and study concepts using resources online. But when it comes to actually writing your source code, it's important that you write it on your own using things that you're already familiar with. And so because of that, it's important that you don't disclose your code or see your classmates code. Um, this whole process of trying to find what's the solution and writing and debugging your own code is vital for you to become a proficient computer scientist. Copying someone else's code uh, short circuits or skips over this whole process. And the only result is you'll have short change your own learning process. And so to discourage this, we will be using automatic tools that can detect identical or similar submissions. And we will be using the uh, guidance from the academic integrity policy um, and uh, offenses to the policy will be, will be reported. Okay, 
just want to check over questions that are in the chat box. So um, there was a quick question about when the first assignment will be released. So the first assignment should be um, ready tomorrow. Um, we're just checking over it real quick and the assignment will be released tomorrow. Okay, um, so there is a new thing that we'll be trying out in this class. So we'll be using the recitations as a opportunity to perform code review and, and to create my work study groups. And I offloaded that program and I brought it over okay. here and I dumped it on my local Windows system where I can now upload. There you go. Um, so just a quick reminder that you make sure that you stay on mute if, um, if you're um, joined via audio. Uh, okay, so we'll be trying to use uh, the recitation sessions as a way to do peer code review on the completed assignments. And the goals for all this is to give you a chance to interact with your students, uh, fellow students during this time of uh, remote learning. Um, the TAs will offer a stylistic code feedback. And so this is to address the kind of uh, ongoing kind of shortfall, which is that because we use auto graders to do the grading, uh, we don't really have frequent chances to give feedback on code. And this is also a way to give some structure to the recitation sections. Um, and so the way it will work, uh, the details are still being figured out, is that we'll form teams of roughly five students per team. As a team, you will review and discuss your programming assignments from the previous assignments. And then as a team, give a very short five minute short summary of, uh, of what you discussed. And a portion of the assignment grades will be at the discretion of the recitation TAs to uh, reflect your participation in, in this study group. Okay, so a few more questions on the chat box. Um, and so the, uh, there's a question about whether or not recitation will be uh, starting this week. The recitation will be starting next week. Okay. Um, so actually, I'll just continue kind of pause real quick at, uh, right now, just so that we cover any concerns and questions about the uh, class mechanics. Uh, just wanted to clarify. Uh, so I, in response to a question from another student, you said that the uh, that an assignment will be released tomorrow but the syllabus says that the first assignment, the first programming assignment that is, will be re would be released next Tuesday. I mean, sorry, next, yeah, so, next, Tuesday, next Thursday. Uh, yeah, so we're giving um, extra time to work on the first assignment and so it will be released early. Okay. Yep. Excuse me? Mm-hmm. Um, where yes. can we find the Rutgers iLab again? Uh, so the Rutgers iLab is, uh, you can find this set of lecture slides and the link to the Rutgers computer science iLab uh, activation, account activation is here. And like, what do we do after we activate our account? Um, so that is um, something that I'll post a link to a quick start guide on how to start using the Linux terminal uh, 
that the iLab offers. So okay. Or if somebody. Soon. Sorry. Sorry. So yes, you're posting a guide like on what to do like after this lecture, probably, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so any further questions about the class mechanics? Uh, I have uh, just one question. Uh, not trying to get ahead of myself, but will we also learn like as we go on to more like uh, theoretical stuff, right? Uh, like, uh, it, like such as digital logic and whatnot, will we also learn how to like, uh, how do I say it? Um, will we also learn like how to use the C programming language to like perform tasks? That relate to that top that relate to that current to ongoing topic. Um, yes, so those are all also going to be programming type assignments to to work with those concepts. All right, thank you. Yep. Hello, Professor. Yes. Can you please elaborate on the last? Um, bullet of the mechanics section on the previous page. Uh, recitation TAs have full discretion to award a portion of assignment grades for participating. What does it exactly does it mean? Okay, so as an example, so as example for the assignment, uh, the programming uh, tasks are going to be most of the assignment grade. Right. The exact pr pr proportion we're still trying to fine tune. Um, but a few points of that assignment is going to come from attending recitation and doing code review with your classmates during recitation. Right. So some of these points may be uh, uh, a portion of the assignment grade and some of the points may be extra credit. So exactly what that'll look like, it's something that we'll be calibrating. Okay, so if I got 10% on the assignment, it is an opportunity for me to get some of these points back just from participation. Did I understand it correctly? That's that's something that, that's something that's a possibility, yes. Okay. And okay, so what happens if I get 12%? Uh, Staying so, optimistic here. <laughs> so if you so for example, yeah, the, each programming assignments were 12%. If you already get 12% on the assignment, you can still attend code review as a way to get extra credits. Okay, understood, thank you so much. Yes, uh, and so um, the exact proportions of this is something that we're gonna be fine tuning as we go along. Okay. So um, we'll come back and kind of address any lingering questions about mechanics uh, toward the end of class, but let's move along uh, in terms of uh, why study computer architecture and where it fits in to uh, the trajectory and your understanding of computer science and computer engineering. Okay, um, so the goal of this class is at the end of the course, we would like students to have the preliminary skills to design and evaluate solutions that involve the hardware interface, the software hardware interface, and use those ideas to address new and important problems in computer science. Okay, uh, and so the title for this little section um, I chose from uh, uh, article um, authored by uh, Hennessy and Patterson. So Hennessy and Patterson are important computer architecture researchers who wrote uh, a seminal textbook in the field. And in 2018, they won the Turing Award, um, the highest honor in computer science for their work in uh, furthering computer architecture. 
Um, and so I recommend all of you to go take a look at this article. They also have a video of, of their um, award acceptance speech that talks about why computer architecture is more important now than ever. And so uh, computer architecture has been a significant driving force that enabled this whole digital era of computing that, uh, that has dominated uh, the world in the past 50 years. So there's no, no question about how uh, computing has fundamentally changed the way people communicate, do work, um, and so forth. Uh, and this history has actually been enabled by a series of important architecture abstractions that allow us to create the computers as we know it today. So some of these abstractions are things that we'll be talking about in this class, right? So here is a, um, uh, a slide that I've, I've used in the past to talk about the history of computer architecture. And some of these important abstractions allowed us to move forward in each decade to create more complicated, but also easier to use computers. And so some of these abstractions include things like the stored program concept, where we store the instructions for running a program in the computer memory. These concepts include things like uh, microprogramming, which is a way to build the processor and enable more complicated instructions within the processor. It includes things like creating a standard set of instructions for accessing the hardware so that you uh, so that uh, programs can run across different pieces of hardware, even if they are from different eras. And uh, more recently, there's this thing called RISC, which is a style of designing the interface to your computer hardware that underpins a lot of important computing devices today, like the ARM-based chips inside your in your cell phones um, and, 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 lap, uh, and, and in tablets, okay? Um, and these things like abstractions in computer architecture in conjunction with improvements in the very devices that build, complete, build the computers like transistors have driven the digital revolutions and created the computing world that we have today, okay? Um, so I see a quick question of, uh, what are examples, if any, of a analog versus digital computer? Okay, uh, so this is kind of more of a, uh, a personal introduction um, to this topic. Uh, so this is a slide that I'm borrowing from, um, from my thesis presentation. So during my thesis, I worked on a style of computing where we're using uh, we're using uh, the full range of electronic signals, analog signals to represent information. And so my research work was to investigate if there's any merits to trying out that style of computing, right? Um, and so this distinction between encoding numbers as analog values versus encoding numbers as digital binary strings of numbers this is a kind of abstraction that enabled us to build more reliable and more complicated computers. And this idea of encoding numbers as binary strings, that's something that we'll be talking about during the data representations portion of this class. So that's something about, uh, that'll be something that we'll be talking about in about five weeks time. Okay, the takeaway from here is that architecture abstractions are important for creating the computing world as we know it today. And these abstractions and improvements in the transistors that build the computers, how we organize them to build computers, these improvements have progressed very steadily 
from the time that they were first invented in you know, 1950s, 60s, all the way until today. But if you look at the fundamental trends of what's happening in constructing computers, you'll notice that uh, uh, there are new challenges in creating computers in the way that we always have. And so what this is plotting um, is two things. So we're plotting on the, uh, on the vertical axis here, the uh, transistor size, which describes what's the smallest features that define the devices that construct your computer as a function of um, time. So this is covering the past 20 years of development. And so what this is showing is as you decrease the fundamental size of the devices that create the chips that make your computer, you're able to pack more and more of those transistor devices into a given area. And so a cell phone from 2000 compared to a cell phone that we have today, the one from today is gonna to be a lot more um, capable and more have more capacity, have more functionality than the one from 20 years ago. And at the same time though, because we're packing more and more devices, transistor devices into the same area as before, we're also causing the power consumption of devices for that given space that the chip occupies higher and higher. And so if you actually take this calculation and take the, this amount of power that's being dissipated in your chip and multiply that out for a typical computer chip in, in, a, in a cell phone today or in a laptop today or in desktop computers today, you'll realize that the amount of power that's being dissipated in that chip, it can be uh, the same amount of power that's uh, of a typical thing like something like a, uh, a drying machine, for example. Right. So these chips are generating so much heat and so much power that if it's not carefully controlled, they would melt themselves or catch fire and so forth. And so this is what we call the power wall. So the power wall is that as we want to pack more computing power and extract more capability out of our, out of our computers uh, in time going to the future, we're going to be limited by the amount of power we can take away from those chips and cool off those devices. And this constraint, this power constraint has led to a overall trajectory in computing history that looks something like this. So this is plotting from a longer time era ago. So from the 1980s all the way to present, the computing power in log scale on the y-axis versus that time. And so you will notice that a lot of the growth that we had was actually from uh, the 1985 era to the early 2000s. And more recently, this trajectory, while it's still growing uh, on a log linear scale, it's not growing as the same rate as we had before. And so this is concerning because the capability, uh, ability to, to cram more computing power into smaller footprints and extract more computing power out of our computers is something that has driven uh, the computing world as we know it. Uh, and so we're trying to find ways to continue with this trend. Okay, so I just wanna check in with the uh, chat box here. Okay, so one question is about essentially the more technology we have, the less power that is distributed around the components and vice versa. Um, let me just make sure I understand what that's trying to claim here. Um, 
So Sadman, you posted the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was me. Uh, my question, I, I suppose in a little more to elaborate, was that essentially, you know, the more technology that is needed to deliver a certain task, like judging, like reading this graph, reading this line graph. So the more technology that was present, then essentially the less power that was distributed around those technology components just for a certain task, like uh, that is distributed around those components to complete like certain tasks. But as time went on, uh, the need like technology become like the relative amount of technology is less due to like due to like you know more processing due to the ability to process uh, for more processing but the, so more power is power is distributed uh, you are are you understanding like what i'm trying to ask um so let's maybe let me just maybe like um rephrase the takeaway for this this graph here right um so let's take a given size of a chip um so let's just take for example a chip that has the size of one centimeter squared this is something that will be very typical that you have in your laptop for example and so inside this fixed fixed area inside this fixed area as time went on as the transistors got better and better and smaller and smaller in this fixed area you were able we were, we've been able to pack more and more complexity we've been able to pack more and more devices more more transistors and create cpus create processors that have more capability and also they've been able to store more data right and so this the way that this this transistor scaling has uh, has scaled down is part of the reason why a laptop or a cell phone from 2020 can perform tasks faster than one from the year 2000. And likewise, the amount of storage that you have it in it, right? So you can now we have uh, gigabytes of data that you can store locally in your cell phone. You know, some may even have almost a terabyte. Compared to the year 2000, we were talking about, you know, packing only a few megabytes of storage then. And so this device scaling is a part of the reason why we have more useful and more capable devices that we have today. But then the kind of trade off is in that inside this given area that you have to cram all your transistor devices. Now that you're using those devices to do computation and do more computation in that given area, the amount of energy that's being dissipated inside that area has grown and grown. And so one of the key challenges right now is our ability to whisk away that energy, whisk away, whisk away that heat, uh, waste heat, that uh, extra power so that you can keep your device at a reasonable temperature. And this challenge, this power restriction is one of the reasons why uh, the breakneck pace of improving computer, um, improving computing devices has not continued in the way that it has before. So let me just again, check on the chat box. Um, so Arjun had a quick question that was relevant here, which was about lower nanometers, more transistors in the chip. Right. So that's correct. So lower nanometers means that the transistors themselves are each smaller. And so you can cram more of them inside a given chip. And so in a typical uh, laptop uh, CPU today, you would find on the order of something like four or five billion transistors in that chip. And some of the other questions we'll get around to uh, in a few slides. 
Okay. And so again, this is kind of motivating what is the bigger picture and what is the broader direction of compute, computer science, computer engineering, computer architecture as a field, and what are the open challenges that we're trying to wrangle with. And so because of these power restrictions that we had uh, that we had just talked about, one of the ways that the field and the industry is evolving is we are creating things that are called heterogeneous architectures. And what these things are, are new ways to organize computers that are very distinct from the ones that we have, have done before, okay? And so these are things like GPUs. So this is a way to perform tasks with great parallelism using computing chips that were originally meant as a way to render graphics. And now we're using them to, to perform computations for things like uh, machine learning, for example. Some other ideas include things like creating FPGAs. And so FPGAs are a thing called field programmable gate arrays. What they are, are chips that you can reconfigure on the fly so that they, are become, they become very specialized at giving, uh, performing a very specific task. So for example, uh, you can have a FPGA that's been reconfigured to be very good at, rate, uh, at, at decrypting uh, information. If you realize like your computer, a lot of the time and energy is spent performing a specific kind of decryption, you can create a specialized chip that is highly specialized at performing that task. Um, and at even bigger scales, people have been building uh, supercomputers based off of these specialized computer architectures to solve important problems like uh, performing the computation needed to figure out how to fold a protein or to design a drug or to, uh, or to um, perform a machine learning task. There are many, many different types of directions where people are investigating ways to create specialized hardware to address important challenges. Um, so I'll just go through one more slide before I double check on the chat box. And so kind of some of the open and evolving areas that make computer architecture an important area to, to learn about and study and to participate in today are so um, some of the directions that computer hardware is gonna move into into the future. So we just talked about heterogeneity, which is the idea that you would create specialized hardware for specialized problems. We need to create ways to perform a computation using less energy. So this has implications on uh, making your phones and laptops and iPads uh, last longer on a given battery charge. And then a, a different, on the end of, different end of the spectrum, another huge challenge is that uh, a lot of the computational power today in the world is hosted in data centers that technology companies build to perform their computation. So things like Gmail is a application, it's a program that runs in a Google data center somewhere in the world. And typically these data centers are gonna be hosted in places where uh, energy costs are cheap and- I know and data centers near you. Sorry about that. That would uh, where uh, where cooling and energy is relatively cheap, and these data centers are such, such a huge scale that some of these data centers may um, take the energy requirements of a small city. And so, being able to address the energy consumption of those data centers is a really important part in addressing uh, global warming addressing the energy challenges that we have in the world today. Some other issues too. Uh, increasingly, uh, security and privacy concerns are going to be um, dealt with or emerge from computer architecture. And so very recently, within the past five years, 
uh, Intel and potentially also AMD, they've had these bugs called Spectra and Meltdown, where the reason that there is a security breach in a computer is not just because of software, but it was actually because the way that the computer hardware is performing computations. It was doing the computation in a way such that a clever hacker can actually trick the hardware to disclose information that's not supposed to disclose. Right? And so security and privacy is increasingly in the domain of computer architecture. And finally, there are these interesting topics called virtualization, which is this idea of creating an illusion where a lot of different uh, users can use the same piece of hardware, but creating the illusion that they have their own piece of, um, they have, that they have access to the machines directly, right? And so for example, uh, Amazon's AWS service is one of the most important website hosts in the world. And what they offer is a data, data center service where users can log in and they can use Amazon's computer as if it was a private, per, privately owned uh, server, right? And this is enabled by technologies um, that are enabled by uh, this idea of virtualization. Okay, so let me just quickly check on the chat boxes. Yeah, so there's a question about, um, uh, is AWS like iLab? So that is a little bit like that idea, right? So um, AWS is not quite like iLab. So iLab is a, uh, a handful of Linux computers, very powerful computers offered by the computer science department. Uh, there are servers that you can log into. And then once you're logged in, you can use the Linux operating system on iLab as if you had um, your own copy of Linux. Um, so there's a little bit of fine distinction in terms of whether or not um, company use company use AWS in the same way that we use we as uh, computer science students, you would use iLab. But the basic idea is kind of the same idea where you have centralized resources that allow a lot of users to access those powerful computers um, that are centrally managed. Uh, so Swapneil asks, are there architectures for sharing computations among multiple tasks requests? So for example, programs A and B both want to know one plus one. So this idea that Swapneil is asking for, which is something like, uh, are there architectures that allow uh, a single request, so some specific request, some demand to be fulfilled by the same hardware. This is a kind of idea that we'll talk about in the caching part of this class. So caching is a way where the computer architecture or software or hardware identifies that some piece of data, some piece of information is very frequently used. And so it will keep it at a level in the memory hierarchy so that is more readily available. Okay, so this is actually a very nice idea to kind of bring all this together in terms of Amazon AWS, in terms of caching, in terms of memory hierarchy, and this idea from Swapneil, which is can you satisfy a single request using a single piece of hardware from a lot of different users, right? Um, so 
maybe to make this more concrete, we can think about like um, uh, a service like um, like uh, like YouTube, for example, right? So on YouTube, one of the most I don't know if it's still the most popular video is is Gangnam Style. So if YouTube server is trying to host Gangnam Style, the video for Gangnam Style, where would it put it in this hierarchy? It would probably keep it at some level in the hierarchy where it is offered it very quickly, where storage is expensive, but it can satisfy that request very, uh, very, quick, uh, very quickly. But for some video that's gonna be less popular, so for example, uh, the video for this lecture, much fewer people are gonna be accessing that video. And so it would make sense for that uh, server to host that data where the storage is not as fast, but it's gonna be much cheaper, right? And so this kind of idea of caching, the memory hierarchy and uh, centralized resources is something that enables uh, services like that. Uh, let's just double check any other questions from the chat box. Okay. And so in kind of the 10, 11 minutes that I have left, I just want to really quickly talk about, again, what are the exciting and tunnelizing future directions for computer architecture? And so the idea here is in the far future, because we're starting to run into limitations in how we construct uh, computers, computer architecture today, researchers and companies and industry is looking into fundamentally new ways to encode information. And this leads to new paradigms of computing, such as quantum computing, such as creating specialized hardware for performing machine learning and so forth. And uh, some of these topics uh, uh, are things that we will talk about uh, where relevant uh, during the, the, the class. Um, but the overarching theme here is that in the future, as we have important uh, problems that we want to solve uh, in the world, applications that we want to run quickly, and as we have constraints coming down, uh, coming up from below in terms of what the hardware can offer, we need to find new abstractions, new tools to map those problems down to these new types of computer devices that will be coming in the future. Okay, and so how does all this relate to this class here, right? So this introductory class in computer architecture. So this ties back in the sense that in this class, you'll learn about techniques like programming in C, programming in assembly, like working with the cache, working with the memory, understanding how digital logic is built. These core ideas are the ideas that allow us to build abstractions that are opening and paving the way for us to create new kinds of computers in the hardware uh, in the future. And so, learning the concepts in this class will introduce you to this. To this uh, to this area of practice, to this research area, to all these ideas that are super exciting uh, going into the future. It will open the door to understanding these things that will come into reality and become important within our lifetimes. And oftentimes a lot of them, in a lot of cases within the next few years. Okay, and so that's why it's important to study computer architecture. That's we, why we require it as a class for the computer science major. That's why we want to cover these fundamental ideas like programming, like abstractions, like memory, like digital logic, because they tie into all these future ideas. Okay, so that is the slides that I have for today. Um, I will just also check on the chat box to see if I have any questions, uh, if there's any questions I haven't addressed. 
Um, but also if you have questions, feel free to chime in. Excuse me? Yes. Regarding the required textbooks, so um so is is the only version for the um um for the um computer systems is only the third edition the only version that's acceptable for course currently? Uh, you can use any version. You can probably get away with the second edition. Um, you can so, use earlier editions, third edition is pre preferable. So, I mean, the takeaway is like, we're not gonna be assigning like problem sets from the textbook. So um, basically, that, that's the only, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Sorry, so basically like when it comes to the general readings, like any edition is more or less similar. And since you're not assigning problem sets, having the wrong edition wouldn't really affect us negatively. No. Um, you just want to double check that, for example, if I refer to a section header, you know, like section 3.2 as the relevant section, you just want to make sure that those section headers are numbered in the same way between between editions. So like if some if like you give us a section like 3.2 and it says like program encoding, we'd have to make sure that our 3.2 is also basically that. That's right. Okay, thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions in the chat box that I didn't really address? Feel free to uh, bring it up now. Some uh, of these kind of flew by pretty quickly. Uh, so some of us right now are, are like, well, are interested in like, you know, uh, if you can talk a bit more about what you're currently like researching into, what you're currently, what current research you're working on. Um, sure. So. Some of the research I work on now is focused on creating future computer architectures. And so specifically, recently, uh, quantum computing has become a really important paradigm in computer architecture. So these basic ideas of the mathematics, the physics that enable quantum computing, it's something that we've understood should work for decades now. But basically, very recently, in the past five years, finally, researchers have developed prototype quantum computers that are big enough, that are reliable enough, that we can start actually using, try to use them to solve problems. And so we have this challenge where we know that there are interesting ways to use quantum computers to build to, to solve problems. We have prototype computers that can, can address those problems. And we need to fill out this, this gap in between. We need to fill out the computer architecture abstractions between the problems and the hardware. So what are those abstractions? Those are things like, we need to create programming languages for them. We need to create compilers like GCC for quantum. We need to create a instruction set architecture to use quantum computers. All of these ideas that we'll touch upon in this class, programming languages, uh, memory hierarchies, compilers, and so forth, are trying, we're trying to bring them forward and port them over to new ways to, of doing computing. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So it's like it, it, it's like devising devising new sorts of architecture so that it's easier for quantum computers to perform a lot more diverse applications. Yeah, that's a perfect way to to put it. All right. All right. That's interesting. So and so what is and so I just just another question. I don't, I don't know if you're like I don't know if you know if you know so much about this, but are they like? Are currently researchers, I mean, that's a little broad, but like, what's the agenda right now? Is it to like devise new original ways of like new original architectures or how to like say, or building upon established compilers and architectures and figure out a way for them to be able to uh, compute and com uh, make computations at the quantum level? So, you know, this is 
I mean, this is just kind of give a flavor of what, what future computer architectures may look like. But the key idea is that these new ways of doing computing are fundamentally new ways to map data, to devise algorithms. And so all of these layers would need a rethink and redevelopment. So it's a wide open area and that's why, um, that's why, that's why these folks won the uh, top prize and top honor in, in computer science, the Nobel Prize of Computer Science for developing these ideas that we'll study in this class. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Um, so we're uh, either we're already over time or we are very nearly at the end of the scheduled lecture. Um, so I'll officially end class here. Um, if you want, you can stick around and I'll be taking questions um, uh, here on the Zoom. Hello, Professor. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, are you going to post this recording uh, later on Canvas? Um, yeah, so the way the videos will work is uh, I'm recording this lecture video now. I'll be posting it to uh, YouTube, and then I'll post the link for that to Canvas. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, a few questions. A few kids asked the same question about can we attend other recitations that we aren't registered for? Or do we have to attend our own recitation for the participation points? Um, I need to get a sense of how many people have time conflicts for the recitations. Um, that's a little bit TBD. I may have to be addressing that case by case. Professor, um, how are the teams configured for the assignments? Are they individual? Are there teams? Um, what are your uh, thoughts? So the programming assignments are individual assignments. What we're trying to do is we're going to use the recitation time with the TAs as an opportunity to review the assignments that were turned in so that you can study the assignment, kind of go over what, what the assignment did, uh, how the code worked um, during that time. All right, so it's a way for us to give more structure to the recitation time and to, uh, to uh, motivate you to uh, give each other code review and feedback on your coding assignments. Okay, because earlier you said that there would be team, like here, yeah, teams of five students presenting their code. So how would that work? They would put so together, is, go ahead. So this, yeah, so this is during the recitation, uh, we would create teams and then you would uh, uh, go over the previous assignment and talk about the code. So the discussion can be free form. You can just, uh, you can say things like, oh, we didn't know how to do this part, or this is what the student did, or this is what this other classmate did. And then after that discussion, you'll as a team give a very short summary of what you had talked about. Okay, understood. Thank you so much. Uh, yep, thank you. Professor, two, uh, before I leave, two short questions. Uh, one is uh, since, uh, you already mentioned you'll release the first assignment early. So there won't be any change to the due date according to the syllabus, right? It's gonna be due, I think, early February, right? The first assignment. That's right. So it's gonna be released early so that you have extra time to get started on it, um, especially a lot of the iLab and Linux uh, type of questions and the due date is unchanged. Okay, all right. And the other question is like, as we go on through the semester and as the site and as we, and the assignments, you know, we'll tackle different parts of the uh, parts of the course. Will do the assignments, like do the content of the assignments, like sort of build up on one another in a way? Generally, or they tackle um, like different parts? 
Generally, no. Um, kind of the constant thread throughout all of this is that you need to learn how to program proficiently in C and to uh, build and debug your C programs. Otherwise, the kinds of topics and details that they each tackle is going to be different. OK. All right. Uh, that's all I have. Um, thank you for everything, and I'll see you on Thursday. Sounds good. All right. Have a good day. I have one more question about recitation. So yes. uh, what are we going to do the weeks that we don't have code reviews, unless we have code reviews every week? Or do we have recitation like only after assignments are due? I'm not entirely sure about the timeline. So during the weeks that we're not doing code review, uh, the TAs will be going over um, just kind of common questions uh, about the material, uh, material in class. And if we can't attend one of those recitations, should we email the should we email the TAs or you or like how does attendance work? Um, so are you currently which section are you currently registered in? I think seven. And um, let me just see what's the se section seven recitation time slot. It's later tonight, uh, like I think six. And so are you able to, is that a time conflict for the whole semester or just for today, no, for example? It, uh, it, it may be occasionally. Then in that case, that's, that's no problem. You should still, you should remain uh, registered in section seven um, and try to attend uh, as much as possible. And the days I can't, should I email my TA, I'm guessing? Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Have a good day, I appreciate it. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the, end the Zoom session here. Um, thanks all for attending live.